Thank you very much, Gareth, uh, for inviting me here tonight. So I hope when it all goes pear shaped that you'll not be too hard on them. I, I want to talk about a number of things tonight. First of all, I want to talk about the plantation of Ulster. And I want to talk about it in fairly general terms. So I want to talk about the plantation of Ulster in fairly general terms. Then I want to talk about uh, the plantation of County Londonderry, tell you something about that, as, as requested and has required. Then I, I will uh, look at the plantation in a slightly broader sense again. And then I will make some concluding remarks about how we might view the plantation of Ulster today. So uh, let's get the show on the road, as they say. There are two very good reasons for thinking about the plantation of Ulster tonight. First, uh, I see you've been funded by the Community Relations Council, so I'll do a plug for Community Relations. First, Ulster's rich tapestry of cultural diversity largely has its origins in the early 17th century plantation of Ulster, with its influx of mainly Protestant, English and Scottish settlers. Thus, the plantation has proved to have been one of the most politically significant mass migrations to have taken place in Western Europe uh, since medieval times. The other very good reason for thinking about the plantation of Ulster tonight is that over the next few years we will be commemorating, marking, celebrating, whatever word you choose, the 400th anniversary of the plantation. The plantation, uh, in a sense, uh, it's, it's slightly awkward tonight in that this has been funded in part as well by the Ulster Scots Agency, but obviously in some respects the plantation of Ulster uh, uh, with respect to County Londonderry is at least initially an English plantation rather than a Scottish one. So I'm torn between how you keep this, this balance. Anyway, I will talk to some extent about the Scottish aspects of it and also talk about the English dimensions of it. A.T. Q. Stewart, in his marvellous book, The Narrow Ground, recalls that at the outset of the Troubles, contrite Scotsmen wrote to Belfast newspapers begging forgiveness for the consequences of James VI and First's disastrous intervention in our affairs. <laughs> These people were really rather silly. At their closest point, some 12 miles of water separate Ulster from Scotland. And in truth, the word separate is totally inappropriate. Because this stretch of water, far from separating uh, Ulster and Scotland of the two coasts, actually uh, was a means of communication which facilitated uh, movement backwards and forwards between Ulster and Scotland. From the earliest times to the present, from the Mesolithic settler and missionary saint to the migrant seasonal labourer and early 20th century, well, early 21st century medical student, the narrow waters of the North Channel have witnessed and carried a constant stream of traffic, a constant stream of traffic of people and ideas between the two coasts. Thus, to talk about the, the North Channel separating Ulster from Scotland is, is really to miss the point. The North Channel actually formed a, a connection, was almost the equivalent of a motorway in, in previous times. And this idea of a connection between Ulster and Scotland uh, prompted the significant, the, early 20, the very famous and important uh, early 20th century historian G.M. Trevelyan to describe the connection between Ulster and Scotland as a constant factor. Why did the, the, the plantation of Ulster take place? I think this is one of the most important questions. And I will try to answer that. James I of England and James VI of Scots took a very close interest in the plantation. And this is evidenced by the great many commissions and surveys which were established prior to the establishment of the plantation and subsequently to monitor its progress. James was also immensely pleased with the plantation project 
which he regarded as one of his policy masterpieces. In 1612, James Tozer Arthur Chichester, his Lord Deputy in Ireland between 1605 and 1615, that he esteemed, quote, the settling of religion, the introduction of civility, order and government amongst a barbarous and unsubdued people to be acts of piety and glory and worthy always of Christian prince to endeavour. In 1603, even with the end of the Nine Years' War and the subjugation of Ulster, the last bastion of Gaelic power, Ireland remained a strategic problem, a point which had been dramatically underlined by the arrival of a Spanish army in Kinsale in 1601. The Spanish had arrived in Ireland to, to effect a junction with O'Neill, O'Donnell and Maguire. Fortunately, the Spanish landed in the wrong place, the wrong end of Ireland, far removed from the O'Neill's power base. So the Spanish were defeated at Kinsale. As the Venetian ambassador to London shrewdly observed, and this is what he said, Ireland is such that it would be better for the king if it did not exist, and the sea alone rode here. James's advisers contended that if Ulster was planted with good English and Scottish corn, or colonies of civil people of England and Scotland, the country would be ever after happily, happily settled. It seemed a most attractive solution to an otherwise intractable problem. Particularly to encourage Scots to settle in Ulster, represented a tremendous vote fast on the part of the government in London. Normally policy in London had been directed at keeping the Scots out of Ulster. Success in achieving that policy objective was on a par with King Canute's efforts at holding the incoming tide at bay. In other words, it just couldn't be done. In terms of the plantation of Ulster, there were really two plantations, an official an almost exclusively Scots plantation in counties Antrim and Down, and to some extent in Monaghan, and an official plantation in the remaining six Ulster counties. Hugh Montgomery, the Laird of Braidstain in Ayrshire, and James Hamilton, an adventurer and a don at Trinity College Dublin, spearheaded the uh, unofficial plantation in North Down and the Ards Peninsula. Hugh Montgomery, who was remarkably well informed about events in Ulster, knew that Con O'Neill of Clandy Boy was imprisoned in Carrickfergus Castle on suspicion of treason. Montgomery undertook to secure a pardon for Con from James I and James VI in return for his share of his lands. Somehow or other, it's not clear to me how, James Hamilton also got in on the action. Thus, in 1605, James made a triple division of the Clandy Boy estate, one third to Con O'Neill, one third each to Montgomery and Hamilton. However, Con was no match for his new neighbours, and within a few years they had got their hand, hands on Con's portion as well. Montgomery and Hamilton may not have been overly scrupulous in their treatment of the shiftless Con O'Neill but they were able and energetic settlers. The prosperity of North Down, as well as a strong Scottish character, had its origins in their labours. The official plantation in counties Armagh, Cavan, Coleraine, Donegal, Fermanagh and Tyrone was facilitated by the so-called Flight of the Earls. The departure of Q O'Neill and Q O'Donnell, the Earls of Tyrone and Tyrconnell respectively, and some 90 of their followers who sailed from Loch Swilly for the continent on the 3rd or 4th of September 1607 created a power vacuum and allowed the Crown to charge the Earls with high treason in their absence and to declare their lands forfeit. As early as the 17th of September 1607, Chichester submitted to the English Privy Council's Council proposals for the disposal of the fugitives' lands. In March 1608, Chichester prepared notes of remembrance, which he further revised in October 1608 for a plantation in Ulster. 
In July 1608, a commission was established to survey the six Ulster counties which were to constitute the official plantation. In January 1609, a detailed plan for a plantation of the six Ulster counties, including the conditions to be observed by the planters, was completed. So you have a period there of very, very intense activity. The Scottish settlers came from Lanarkshire, Ayrshire, the Scottish borders and the Lovians. James I thought that his fellow countrymen would be excellent material for the plantation because, quote, they are of a middle temper between the English tender breeding and the Irish rude breeding and are a great deal more likely to adventure to plant Ulster than the English.